Looking a little light today. We'll give it till about five after and then we'll kick things off. All right, it's five after. Um, we ready to get going? Sounds good. If you haven't had a chance, please add yourself to the attendees. And if there's anything you wanna to add to the agenda, um, go ahead and throw it in there. Um, typical, you know, upcoming events plug. Um, Obviously, KubeCon's coming up next month. There's going to be the CNF Working Group intro slash deep dive session. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other uh, sessions that are going to be relevant to the CNF space that they think we should list here, or if anybody in our group is presenting, but please feel free to um, add with a link to your case. And then um, I was kind of hoping that instead of slogging through pull requests today, we would continue the discussion from last week around uh, use cases and best practices, um, maybe specifically focusing on delivery and platform, try to capture some notes and then maybe we could open up some issues or discussions after this and then start getting these populated in the repository. Yeah, well, Jeff, I'm, I'm agree with that. Like, but I, there is just one PR, it's just it's a small fix of typos and um, dictionary. I don't know, you want to take a quick look. Uh, uh, of that one is, um, let me grab the number.
Ja, das klingt nach. I did an initial glance at this. Um, I don't think there's probably anything earth shattering. Probably have to go through a few more times. I mean, I looked in everything, small grammatical, so I'm good to approve it when I reviewed it this morning. There'll probably need to be a few more passes um, out over it too, just in general, but. If other people want to um, approve it, and we hit the magic five before the end of this call, we'll merge it. I think cool. uh, for spelling, it's just one. Yeah, so I think we can merge it. Yeah, we can merge this one. Nothing but spelling, there's no, um, yeah, I guess for some reason I thought I read like a grammar fix or something or like language. The word, I think is the word list makes it feel like it was dictionary or something, but um it's it's all just related to grammar and spelling and everything else linting Okay. Victor, thanks for diving in and cleaning that up for us. Oh, anytime. Thanks. And yeah, this one. Do we want to take a peek real quick before diving into new ones? Look at um, no root. Uh, one thing that could happen on this one would be relating it to the existing use cases. It doesn't have to be a new use case. So in that, that one section is really the only place that was left in this um, use cases and user stories. Mm -hmm. And if we have something um, relating it to the existing ones that would work as well. We have the, a longer least privilege use case that we've been write, uh, writing up, but that one's not complete. So there's really two paths to get this one done. Finish the least privilege, add an, that new user story uh, use case, or relate this to existing ones. Even something as small as the discussion for, uh, forum item that Frederick added for bumping the wire firewalls, that could be used, something very minimal. It's just, we wanna provide this section and the best practices just for providing context.
I've gone through this one a few times. I basically just need to review now that most of the um, comments have been resolved. And there's still a couple of Ianisms from like a uh, writing style standpoint, I think that we might want to tweak a tiny bit, but. Um, okay, well, I mean, we can dive into this one, Taylor, if you want to um, lead us through it, or we could kind of do some brainstorming to generate some issues slash discussions and get, and then try to get people to kind of work asynchronously on generating some of these um, best practices and use cases and stuff. We don't have to do a, a I guess a live working session now, unless that's what people want to do. Okay, well then I kind of just want to read through it again without people staring at my screen while I share. Um, Sounds I'd be good. curious if um, I mean, and I think we could maybe have some use cases that pop up from this. Um, but if we talked about um, the onboarding and lifecycle management use cases, I'd be curious around best practices, people think of delivery. Um, I would specifically like to talk about air gapped installations and um, specifically like what does air gapped in general mean beyond just delivery, but also like, you know, a lot of third parties want to provide like their monitoring um, platform via a SaaS model. Um, doesn't necessarily work, obviously, if there's no direct access to the internet. Um, or, you know, thinking outside the box, like if you're a big, big, you know, customer of a public cloud and you have things like a direct connect or, you know, a VPN to like a private VPC or something like that, could you do the SaaS offering in a private VPC versus a vendor VPC? Um, what would that look like? Like, I don't know if people have thoughts, but I can tell you that I have to go through and constantly figure out how to um, air gap a lot of things. And so I don't wanna just put CICD as a best practice. Um, I'd rather like kind of talk through the nuance with the group here um, around uh, like some of the things I know that I do and that others I talk to do to get artifacts checked in scanned, made available through internal repositories, um, you know, figuring out the right balance of being quick enough, but safe. Um, I'll pause there if anybody just has any high level thoughts before I just start putting stuff into the Google Doc. So you want to brainstorm on potential best practices to explore on these topics? Yeah, I've been thinking that um, a lot of people are kind of hesitant to dive into Git and like 99% of all activity happens on these Monday calls. So I'd kind of like to do some brainstorming and then like a few of us go in, open up some discussions or some issues in the notes section. Um, maybe, you know, mark things as like good first, you know, um, attempts or whatever, especially um, once we get past KubeCon, if we're lucky and we, you know, get some new interested parties in, they could potentially go in and find something that they could pick up that's you know seems obtainable to them and put in a pull request. I don't know if that makes sense or if you have like different thoughts. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, the I have questions about the air gap, but just trying to see what we're going to focus on. Um, if we're going to do brainstorming, it's good to somewhat have um, some rules around it. The idea of putting, um, being able to uh, put forward ideas and not worry about critiquing at the start. And then we um, can come back through after we have a essentially a dump. So whatever people want to look out. So someone may say CICD, that's fine. And then you say, well, what within CICD is a good practice? And you're, if there's a specific challenge on the delivery or whatever, then that can help guide. But the, the idea primarily is to let um, 
someone put something forward without critiquing during that, and then we come back later. And you can add to any ideas as well. So if someone has an idea and you think, oh, what about this, um, this with that one, and just keep adding. Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. I mean, we get like this small one hour a week with a lot of smart people on it. And I'd like to get away from us, you know, looking at voting rules and glossary definitions and instead kind of just start talking about like extrapolating like what people are doing, what developers are, you know, developing, what challenges they're having and getting their software out to customers, like what providers are doing, what the CNCF thinks of all of us crazies trying to like break all the plumbing inside of Kubernetes. Um, and then, like I said, I think then if we go in and also pre-populate some stuff and get, it might be easier for people who, you know, are introverted or, you know, don't have the confidence in the subject matter to just like completely wing it on their own that like, if there's things that they could go in and grab and try to tackle, then we might get a little bit more asynchronous work and then have more things to discuss on these Monday calls. I think the other important thing to cover is also describing the problem is saying, right? Like, I mean, how can we propose something or at least it's something that I really like it from the less privileged um, white paper, like having very clear which is the problem and based on that proposing ideas and I guess it's the best way to tackle those things. So for example, in this case, we can describe what, what, what could be the problems using or that we are facing, right? Hmm. Um, one question I had, um, and I think the least privileged one demonstrates it, is what about the things we can't do today? Um, because as an example with least privilege, right, least privilege would imply that you can, you don't need privilege containers with any level of privilege um, for doing day-to-day -day jobs that we're going to need to do for NFE. But we, we've already discussed that there are places where um, you're going to be asked for cap sys net and um, cap net admin, whichever one it is, and we don't really have an option. So what do we do about places where, you know, we would be saying, well, Kubernetes needs to be better for this to be ideally working? Yeah, that was my take as well, I think. Okay, that's an open question then. Oh, we can dive in. I'm just capturing some notes and, you know, I'll be honest, um, you know, Bill and Taylor, this is probably some place too where we would lean on you guys to be ambassadors, right? Um, I mean, I know that sometimes we have unsensible requests that the upstream community is just gonna balk at because they like to keep things simple. They like the way that Kate's works now. So us coming in and saying, we wanna fundamentally change things, probably not gonna go that far, but if we have like, you know, small sensible requests, um, how do we, uh, from this, this working group, like try to push that like versus trying to infiltrate a bunch of other tags and, you know, little yeah. I, I think the most important thing here is to have a good reason for asking in the first place, right? To say there is truly something we can't do um, because coming to someone saying we want something to change and then turning around saying, but, you know, I don't understand why that would be necessary, why you can't just. Um, so, so we need to have a rationale, uh, uh, particularly since, it, you know, we're working in a specialist subject and it, it's, it has its weird requirements. I agree with what you're saying, and I th having um, being able to write up what is the challenge, um, and what we've looked at, and what's available within the ecosystem, and that we're not finding any anything there that meets the challenge, and then if we have ideas, then we can point to some of those, but 
I would focus more on a high level idea for potentially solving the problem versus an implementation specific. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't want to jump in and saying we, we should write precisely this code and absolutely not. You should write precisely this code because, you know, that isn't about to happen. It's open source because we write what we need. We don't just expect other people to do our work for us. Um, so it's, um, you know, again, as an example, multiple namespaces. Um, there's a multi solution that allows you to get a certain way with that. But um, you know, since you are going to want to reprogram a namespace, there's only so much that so far that gets you before least privilege is broken. Um, and it becomes, you know, almost impossible after that. Anyway, yeah, so um, fine. Uh, my, my proposal, as much as there is one, is really just that um, we shouldn't rule out possibilities because Kubernetes doesn't do it, do it today. We should just highlight where there is a problem with the way that, um, you know, with what we're asking for and what Kubernetes provides that looks like an extension is required. Um, whether that extension is changing code that exists or writing an entirely new plugin, which obviously Kubernetes is quite happy to let you do, then um, that's a solution specific detail. Jeffrey, um, I have a question around, I guess, the air gap stuff. I, I don't think you're writing other things in there. That's fine. Um, the air gap, I'm having a hard time thinking about the relationship of air gap with cloud native. Um, it's to me, it keeps feeling like air gap is another feature that may be needed by some users, but it doesn't seem like an air, air gap has a direct relationship with being cloud native. So then I'm wondering, is there a way to do uh, air gap, implement air gap solutions in a cloud native way, I guess would be the way to look at it. But I, I'm wondering what you're thinking about when you think about air gap. Do you just think of it as a, a required feature or do you actually think of it as something that is a cloud native thing? A challenge or what? Um, I don't know. It's I think you ask like three different providers, you'll get different answers. Um, so for me, it's an ironclad requirement from my folks in production, right? Like we do not in certain environments um, allow direct internet access. In some cases, not even through a proxy or anything else, right? Um, for safety reasons, like this gets into, um, all right, let me think of how I want to like phrase this because I've got a lot jumbled in my mind. So A, I don't think that like whether or not you air gap something or don't air gap, it makes it cloud native or not cloud native. So um, I think that this whole concept of making it quote unquote cloud native via air gapped or non air gapped doesn't quite click in my brain. Um, additionally, you could argue that if you do a bunch of preceding steps right, you've minimized the risk and maybe you don't need to be air gapped, um, assuming that you know exactly what's going into your infrastructure that it's versioned correctly that it's been scanned before it ever sees anything. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is um, there's been lots and lots of stuff hidden underneath the covers where you'll have like, you know, repos, you know, that are listed in charts. You'll have hidden curl commands and automation. You'll have, you know, just things that go out and until you've actually tried to go and install something in a world where there is absolutely no internet and see what breaks. Um, there's probably things that you haven't caught and this like opens up attack vectors. Um, I've seen it a bunch both in my time at a service provider and on the vendor side, helping lots of other service providers. But um, really what it boils down to is, you know, one of our first use cases was um, CNF onboarding and then CNF lifecycle management. We keep talking about the contract between CNF developer and CNF operator. Um, one of the biggest challenges you'll have is getting your software into their network and into their data centers and into their private VPCs and other public cloud um, environments. So, you know, we could argue that it's not a best practice to do air gapped installs. 
um, then we would have to figure out like what we say to service providers who are like, well, then I guess I can't do cloud native. Um, but like I said, I don't think that being air gaps makes you more or less cloud native. It just is a means of how you are managing your dependencies and packages and providing software to environments that maybe don't have direct internet access. It seems like it may limit your choices and implementation. Um, if, if you said you had like say a distributed pipelines, uh, which you went over and uh, there's a use well, case that you've talked about, but if you had something like that coming in and thinking of. Um, but so, okay, real quick though, I'll, I'm gonna disagree with you for a second because I would argue that the distributed pipeline is a best practice that allows me to do air gapped without breaking everything. Like if I have the corresponding web hooks pulling from upstream pipelines, but the initiation of my pipeline is to pull down all dependencies into a private repository, get them scanned, and then make them ready for the next part of the distribution in the pipeline. I think I could still pull this off. Um, and I'm speaking somewhat from firsthand experience. Uh, I can say that it's insanely, insanely challenging to get the initial framework in place, but there are a way for you to get everything you need into your own repositories um, to watch things dynamically upstream and then ensure that stuff is saved and versioned based on the versioning that you're doing within your infrastructure. Um, and if you look at Vuk's use case, right, around the lifecycle management piece, um, you know, it's in my opinion, a bad practice to have colon latest when you build things, right? Like just always pull the latest. You need to be able to like roll back, roll forward. You need to be able to do root cause analysis based on the current version that you're on. And I, I do think that there's best practices that make it so that you can do air gaps while not necessarily like preventing yourself from being able to use a bunch of stuff upstream. All right. So perhaps the question there is, where's the break, right? Does it need to be between your CI and delivery or does it need to be between your CI and the network? You know, you pull the container down, you feed it into your offline, your disconnected CI. Um, without judgment, I'm not saying there's a right answer to that. There's probably, a, it's probably an opinion thing. Well, in different service providers, we'll have different levels of restriction, right? Um, like some, maybe they don't allow just like, you know, publicly, you know, routable IPs, but they have proxies. I mean, and I'll, I'll like to this exact point though, one of the things, you know, is this bullet right here is what would a gate look like? And I mean, mm. probably not getting down into granular, but like, let's say I have, you know, open source repos, vendor repos, et cetera. Like, what does the first gate look like to pull in their artifacts? Like, what initial CI, CI am I doing? You know, how does that roll out? Um, what is the, this is once again, getting to books use case of lifecycle management. If I've got different dependencies and packages changing asynchronously, how am I like orchestrating all that chaos and ensuring that, you know, the contracts that I've made with various entities, whether it's at the platform layer, the application layer, the network layer are being maintained. Um, and like, I'm not proposing any right or wrong answers here. I'm just saying, you know, we keep saying like, what are the challenges? I can just tell yeah. you, this is a challenge that I face every day of my life is figuring out this. Yeah, well, me too. I mean, um, trying to make sure that a build comes out with the same result every time when there's always the temptation of any developer to go and pull a random package from a random source on the internet. Supply chain attacks like that are very, very easy to end up with if you're not careful which isn't quite the same as offline install, but it's there for, for very similar reasons. Um, but that's a thing where I wonder whether we could find a best practice document of someone else's and refer to it. Um, you know, not say, <laughs> subject to our own supply chain attack, someone who changes the source document, but you, you know, so um, uh, that a CI's conclusion should not change just because it's a Wednesday effectively. If I test the same piece, same piece of software, something that claims to be the same piece of software, I get the same results. Um, Jeffrey, it seems like we could go down two different paths with this. One is how to best practices on and, and ways of 
um, deploying into an air gapped environment, supporting air gapped. And the other would be looking at what are the challenges on why air gapped was even needed in the first place. And on that side, there's probably best practices um, and alternatives to solve the problems that air gapped is there to solve with regards to security. And that could open a whole nother area for us to write up the use cases and best practices. Doesn't mean everyone then doesn't use it immediately or anything, but it's I'm mainly just saying a different area to explore. No, it makes sense to me. And it, it sounds like you have a lot of um, insight on why it's there. Is that something that you'd be willing to work on? Uh, sure. I mean, so the first one is, um, you know, security, right? right. Um, specifically minimizing a major attack vector. And once this isn't going to be CNF specific, but we can talk, you know, at least at like high levels is, Obviously, there's the notion of if I'm exposed to the internet, then that means that the internet can attack me. So now, in addition to the inside insider threat, you have you know legitimate like vulnerabilities to the outside world. Um, but once again, inverting that argument is if you are air gapped, it prevents um, a certain level of insider threat. I mean, you're still going to have to worry about east-west you know type attacks, horizontal um, issues, but like. Let's say, um, let's look at the target breach that was in Kubernetes, right? Um, they had a bunch of Kubernetes clusters. I don't, this is public, right? I'm not going to get in trouble for talking on this recording about a case study I read in my, because I, I mentioned, uh, let's scratch out the, uh, the company's name. Um, anyways, there was an issue where they pulled down a Helm chart. Um, the Helm chart had certain things in it that, you know, spun up certain services and exposed certain ports. Um, because these were, these clusters did have, you know, internet facing interfaces. Um, they, you know, eventually got caught up in a scan. Um, a malicious entity like knew that there was this now back door to go in and they went in and, you know, wreaked havoc. Um, so then once again, like, if you don't need to provide a public service, you know, should you be exposing it to the internet at all? And I would argue that the majority of the time you expose it to the internet has nothing to do with like speed, velocity, agility. It has everything to do with convenience. Um, it takes a lot of work to get, you know, your distributed pipelines in place to manage your artifacts correctly. Um, and it's just kind of a pain, right? Like if you're just building stuff in like the development phase, um, you don't necessarily want to, uh, have to first pull in artifacts to a private repository, you know, get them checked, scanned. Um, but there's a big difference between, you know, building on your laptop and building in your actual lab dev environment, right? Like what amount of risk are you willing to expose? So, I mean, uh, that's one thing, the security. And Ex please anybody- Specifically exposure to the internet. So it sounds like if for that one, um, being able to open ports publicly and other things. The first level would be a proxy server and you can't open anything directly. You have to use a proxy. You can do pull only, maybe no push or anything else. No, no capability to open ports. Yeah, but okay. So before we start like, and I know we're not supposed to critique, but I just want to put out the baseline stuff because Okay, go ahead. There's full sure. acknowledgement that there are remediations and stuff, but once again, anytime, and this is why I think security was kind of a tricky one to start with, everything in the security world, right, is around like risk analysis, risk mitigation, like, um, you know, it, it just depends, like what level of risk is your CISO willing to take? If they are super, super risk adverse, um, they might not be willing to do any of this. And then, like I said, um, this once again now gets into the least privileged conversation. Pretty interesting how all this stuff ties together, right? Is like, if I come in with a privileged container that says, hey, Mr. Proxy, I'm allowed to do this. Um, you know, what happens if I pull in a malicious image that then as long as it can phone home to the internet, uh, bad things happen to you. Um, so, but I mean, 
I do think though, everything you just said, Taylor is, is great. Um, you know, like there are definitely ways where you don't have to go full air gapped. Um, I'm just saying though, if you do, right? Like, and keep in mind too, when it comes to service providers, banks and medical, um, sometimes we have regulation. So then it depends on what country we're in and like what restrictions they've put on you from a networking perspective. Like there could be some type of legal restriction mm -hmm. that prevents you, um, right? So like if the NSA, for instance, came in and started hanging out with us or the Department of Air Force, which is doing all kinds of cool things with containers, um, they will not ever in a million years allow you to pull straight from the internet into any of their private data centers, right? There, yeah, the, I, I think we have to remember that security like test is an endless task, right? Nothing can be proven secure. Lots of things can be proven insecure. Nothing can be proven working, but you can prove something doesn't work. So the, the question is always, what mitigations have you got? What are they mitigating? And what's the likelihood that somebody's going to do them? You're arguing that disconnecting your actual active running network of software disconnecting its management side from the internet so that it's not randomly communicating as for instance an iot device in your house might do and you don't know what it's sharing you don't know that it's not just pulling down random software to run is a very strong mitigation for any attack on the management side of the network it's not perfect proof right there's always malicious actors possible in your company but on the other hand it is a strong mitigation for a lot of attack vectors yeah, that's 100% correct. And once again, I'm I'm just presenting a challenge. I have to work in an air-gapped world. Um, I'm not saying that that is a best practice or that everybody should air-gap. Um, you know, it's just a reality that some of us face. So like, you know, goes yeah. back to the original question of like, well, what does that mean for a distributed pipeline? So I'm just kind of like- free, Can we free keep online. adding? I'd, I'd like to keep adding any of these um, so reasons another, behind it. Yeah, another have... thing is um, consistency and um, resili consistency and resiliency, right? So like one thing too about using um, private repos and not allowing things to go upstream to repositories that you don't control is you get to ensure exactly what packages are available in your environments, mm -hmm. right? So like if I, and this gets really important when we start talking about like networking equipment, right? Is, um, you know, typically they're very, very big complex pieces of software, right? Um, that have tons and tons of features. Like you look at like a router, like all the things that it can do if it's like, you know, a high performing high end router from one of the major vendors. And typically there is like an, a certification process, right? Like that um, something like the way that, you know, BGP um, entries are added or withdrawn from your routing table, things like that. Like, Sometimes they tweak it because the RFCs don't just explicitly say, this is how you will write your code. It says, this is the behavior that you should like present. And then it's kind of on the developers to um, achieve that. So like, once again, like if you have a version that you have like ran through all of your tests um, and eventually long-term, yes, distributed pipeline should hopefully mitigate this, but like, you know, I've got four major vendors that I'm, you know, doing BGP peering across, or, you know, I'm as a major service provider in a pop and I'm peering with one of my other um, major service providers, like, and we have an agreement that I'm on this version of, you know, I don't know, since he the call, I'll say I, ASR code, right? Um, how do I ensure that it's always on the package that I want? Well, I control what packages are available. And once again, not saying this is right or wrong, it's just a means of mitigating risk. It's a means of ensuring um, consistency. And where it becomes important, right, is if you have thousands of routers or thousands of CNFs, right? Um, it's pretty easy to make sure everything's on the same page when you're operating in the tens and even the low hundreds. Once you're starting to scale big, big, big things to the thousands and like that kind of stuff, then, um, you know, ensuring consistency through control mechanisms um, is important. And then, like I said, you know, here's another bullet here is um, policy as a means of building trust. You could potentially tackle this a different way than air gapped, right? You could do it so where you write policy that enforces things. So I'm not, once again, trying to prescribe any type of implementation. I'm just talking about some of the things I get. Um, and one of the things is, um, you know, if I control the packages, then I kind of, you know, have a little bit more control of my destiny and I have a 
very like high level of confidence what has or hasn't been deployed in my environments. It, it's, it, it's um, there are a couple of things there. Uh, I don't think there's any, firstly, policy is fine and good, but it's easy to have policy mistakes as well. It doesn't solve any particular problem completely. Cutting things, something off from potentially contacting unsupervised sources of whatever variety is 100% certain, whereas policy is not, because again, there could be mistakes. But um, there are, yeah, I mean, it's the reason. So I was having a conversation last week with somebody about um, trusting software. And one of the things, um, funny you should mention ASRs because it does this, right? ASRs won't run software that hasn't been signed by Cisco. Um, they can recognize it. We have a, I think it's a shared key arrangement, but honestly, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the, the point is that in order to ensure that this thing is running exactly what it's supposed to be running, which is better for all concerned, you know, both us and the operator, um, we make sure it will only run things that we intend it to run. Um, and that's why I stuck the next line in there, which is effectively saying, how do we have um, end to end um, chain of trust, end to end, a guarantee that what you are trying to run is exactly what your CNF author intended you to run. Um, it isn't the same solution, right? Because that software could then try and reach out to the internet and pull extra pieces of code. So you can't prove, it, it's not proof alone that you're getting what you're looking for. But it's another form of proof that says, I am running the thing that I intended to run and also the thing that I ran through CI and so on and so forth. I'm not just running something that Bob in, um, you know, in whatever department decided I would run today because he hacked it around a bit and he thinks it's cool. Um, it has stronger mitigation features for some purposes because it actually stops internal actors from changing your software as well as, you know, pulling the wrong thing off of the internet. So that's another one that um, uh, serves a similar kind of purpose. I mean, what we're ultimately getting to is you run what you intended to run, right? That, that's the use case in, in, its, um, uh, in the shortest form. Uh, it's true for, it's partly true for air gapping that you can't go, you can't have software randomly fetching further instructions from the internet. It's certainly true for end to end chain of trust. Um, the other thing about cutting something off the internet is independently, it cuts off an attack vector and people like that as well for obvious reasons. But um, those are the two purposes I think it's trying to get to. Yeah. Perhaps what we should have done is realize that cutting something off from the internet, air gapping, is not a problem, right? It's not a problem we're trying to solve. It's actually a solution that we're trying to find a reason for. Well, it's, I, I'm gonna shut up after this because I kind of want some other um, opinions see if anybody else has to deal with, but you're right. It, I mean, th this is a solution. And in some cases, depending on like what the, the compliance or regulations are, it might be a forced solution. So then, you know, what are the challenges um, for like, how do you like mitigate this? Like, and I mean, like I said, there are best practices where like, hey, maybe like in certain, like in your dev environment where it's like, you know, the east west type attacks are minimized and you're willing to like risk it. And, you know, the splash domain would be minimal. You put the proxy in there. I don't know. There's a million things, right? But um, I'm just kind of curious to, you know, Alexis, Victor, others, if you, any of you deal with like air gapped environments or worlds, like, do you have to deal with it when you're handing off software, running software, et cetera? Yes, uh, definitely. As soon as we hit production, uh, a lot of the application we're deploying are a gap, meaning they don't have any internet connectivity. Um, the way I've seen this being solved is really to, you know, you, you mentioned the CI CD, but again, I'm going to talk about a solution, not necessarily explaining the problem we had. The, pro the, the reason for the you know, connectivity in prod for these applications was solely because, you know, security purposes. So mainly the, the, the main bullet point here, the first one. Um, and, and, and the way to, to work on it was basically to have a registry in a production environment and a registry 
uh, you know, in a pre-prod environment. And, and, and the only, you know, bridge I would say between the two was the fact that we could push to that prod registry from that, uh, you know, pre-prod registry. And so we just push the artifact that we would have vetted uh, as part of all the testing and all the, 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 the build done prior. And, and as for the network, so of course, some of the practices uh, in this application is don't, don't have any curl in them. Uh, if you need to pull things, well, we would overwrite all the information to point to, to the registry that we own. That registry wouldn't be a proxy registry, it wouldn't proxy anything. It would be fed with the artifact that we would care about. And, um, and, and that's what I've seen from, for an application standpoint. Now, wh while we're talking, I was thinking about um, uh, network function applications. My, 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 I, I, don't, I can't recall how much internet connectivity some of them really required. Um, I didn't work with a lot of them, but some of the projects that I worked with, um, I didn't face that or get issue for these network functions. Well, I can bring up one thing right when we talk about it in the CNF context specifically is, um, you know, licensing. Um, a lot of uh, vendors have moved to like smart licensing servers and I've seen different ways of handling it in the air gap world, but like, you know, the default behavior that a lot would like is uh, you phone home and, you know, hand a token, a key or whatever, say I'm licensed, I've got this functionality, yada, yada. And um Suddenly we say, but we're going to stick this in an air gapped environment. And to like Ian's point, what we're really saying is that the management plane is going to be completely cut off from the internet. So then um, how does something like smart licensing work? You know, and once again, for, there are ways to accomplish it, but I'm not saying I know the right or way, wrong way. I agree. And that phone home is a great example. I've lived through it. Um, the solution that was provided to us at the time was, um, uh, a self-hosted basically uh, phone home uh, server. So the network element would phone home to something that is internal and that internal piece would go out of the internet to, to register to the vendor provided license uh, uh, solution. So again, it's a tiered approach. It's, 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 it's one that I've seen. But I'm not being very practical here. It's just, I mean, it's just a tactical answers to some of the points you had. I, my point was, I, I don't have much to comment on the air gap specifically approach. I, I understand the concerns that, that it's trying to address. And we do see actually a lot of uh, customers that is looking into air gap for, for the RAN, for instance, deploying RAN applications um, closer to the edge. But, but I don't. I'm not armed with enough uh, material right now to <laughs> provide any insightful, uh, you know, comments in the discussion. Honestly, I think you are, you know, because you've effectively come up with an example that demonstrates that this happens, um, which is, you know, the point. It, it's important that we actually have concrete examples rather than just working hypotheses. Sure. Well, the example I can tell you the use case, it's, uh, well, I won't tell too many details, but it's just uh, the VLNS that we have in the data center that, en that enable good connectivity from, uh, from the customer, you know, set up box or, or router home to, 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 to the private CSP network. The, the use case that I've lived, that LMS requires to be, you know, provided a license, exactly what you said, Jeff. And, and so we had a capability in, in the software that we've chosen for it that has a self-hosted um, call home uh, server. And, uh, and that one would proxy basically all the licensing, um, but that's specific to the license. Uh, again, for a network function. On lived experience, actually, just one question there. W was that a thing where at the late, in the late in the day you went to your vendor and they sort of turned a bit pale when you explained that their licensing system was a problem and they needed to rethink it? Or was it well thought out from the beginning? 
<laughs> we we came with that ask after uh, one of the tier, top tier one uh, US uh, telco. <laughs> so when we came in, the code was there for that telco and we could just have it. I can tell you, mm, okay. my experience has been everything from like, they're like, hey, this is a really great idea to, you know, absolutely not, you know. Um, and I can tell you, like, we talk about um, what challenges did we have in the VNF slash NFV space. I can tell you this is one. Um, I've run out of licenses and I'm in an air gap world, so I can't just like suddenly like spin them up on demand. I have to go through like some cumbersome manual PO process and like, Virtual firewalls don't do me a whole lot of good if I can't just spin them up on demand. Like at that point, I have a virtual firewall that from an operations and supply chain standpoint, basically deploys the exact same way that a physical firewall does. Um, so, you know, and we've used some methods like, and this is what I'm actually hoping for, right? Is when we talk about a best practice, I would, I would propose, even though I said I wasn't gonna do this in this phase of the conversation, like a best practice would be like a true up model where like they have some type of, you know, in-house monitoring server that is sitting there and it is just calculating, you know, Mr. Jeffrey here's total consumption right. of ACNF. And then right. I take the bill once a month, once a quarter, and whatever. And I say, this is how much I consume. And they say, this is how much you owe me. Right. Um, and, so and we can have a long conversation on how that gets into some difficulties. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they're not insoluble, but please bear in mind the most important thing you could do right now is write down why that works better than the other solutions you've worked with. Because, um, you know, again, that's a solution. The problem statement is critical. Yeah, Sorry, what I wanted to add is, yeah, no, but what I wanted to add was an, another example that I've lived through uh, where we had to be creative. Uh, basically a UCP uh, solution that we were selling to enterprises. And we were also selling, of course, a uh, VNF that you could put on that VCP. So the customer could order firewall or, or other type of VNFs that we would pre-integrate upper in the chain. Um, to manage licenses for these elements, we, we came up with, you know, uh, license inventory. So we would, we would get you know, a pool of licenses. And as soon as we do an instantiation, we'd get a license from it, mark it as used, consume. But, but again, that's, there's a lot of work at hand and, and it's not answering all of the points that you raised here, but it's another example where it's completely air gapped because um, it's quote unquote human, that feeling that inventory of the license that are available to have that license pool. And the orchestration, which is whenever spin up a VNF in that, UCP, but, but it could be a different use case. Uh, but that's what I've seen. Um, Well, for the package management, what I was suggesting is don't, don't actually have a, a package management that is a proxy, rather have a package management that is completely isolated and you push, it, and you push the package within that package uh, management manager. Um, sure, sure. Container. No, I was just, like, that wasn't in reference. Like you just, as you were talking, it made me think of things and I was just typing down like tangential notes. Okay. No worries. So, when you're saying push it, do you mean a, a package image or image repository as well would be part of the package management system? Yeah, it could be anything uh, like container image, it could be Java artifact, you know, Maven repository. So artifact repository. Thank you. Or repositories. Yeah. Um, well, one well, or the other, I was thinking, I have one technology in mind, but it could be any any technology that provides artifact management, basically. Artifactory Harbor, there's a bunch, right? So, um, and you can, there's some that combine multiple things and then there's others that split it up. So, um, so we'd want something like artifact scanning. And so that's part of the CI CD, right? So before you push things in that 
artifact or, or that Nexus or whatever is the technology, then your pipeline would, but that's part more of the development pipeline um, uh, whenever you're, you're, you're producing your, your artifacts. So yeah, you would artifact, scan the artifact or scan the result images for vulnerability. And, and in that scan, you could, you know, we, we talked about policy at some point, but you could inject policies to check, for instance, hey, I don't want any artifact or container image that have curl in it, because you know curl, you know, it's not going to work in in the uh, in the uh, uh, are not supposed to work in a uh, in the secure environment. Uh, well, it does work. It just doesn't work to the internet. You know, there are reasons why you might want curl. I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable policy if that's the one you choose. But I mean, it's got its uses in different sort of ways. You you'd be hard pushed to find something that didn't have HTTP client code in it somewhere, but. Uh, you, what you're looking for is that it has no means to attempt an internet connection. Correct. Like basically, and I, I'm, since we're getting into this, and I mean, some of this is like artifact scanning, I don't know if that would go in package management or in, you know, best practices for gates. Um, but once again, this is the type of stuff you have to figure out, right? Like um, if you get a bunch of Helm charts or a knit containers that do have curls inside of them and they're pointing to repos, um, even like your Kate's platform, right? Like if it thinks it can just go straight up stream to pull a new version of Kubelet, um, you have to go in and basically make sure that everything has been cleaned up and is pointing to these private repositories. And then, you know, you have to have some type of other automation that is watching the upstream repositories and pulling those in and making them available. I mean, yeah. it's doable, it's just a lot of work. And I mean- it, it, it's, I, I think actually it's not doable. You're trying to prove a negative. Is this ever going to go to the internet to do something? Well, I can check that for every circumstance I've tested, it isn't doing that, but I can't tell you that it's never gonna try doing that because I haven't found every particular way of, you know, poking it. So, you know, if you're proving a negative, you can't. I'm so, not trying to prove anything. I'm saying that I can set up things to where I pull in dependencies to a private repository. And then as I'm going through all of my testing and validation, I'm ensuring that everything that I do points to the private repository. Will I catch everything? No, but then it'll break and I'll go in and say, oh, this broke because it was trying to like curl to this URL that is out on the internet. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to prove or disprove anything. I'm just saying like, you can do this and I have to see how much I'm allowed to share of what we're doing internally because I don't want to get myself in trouble. But um, but like there are ways to do this, and you could argue that doing it air gapped in the beginning was not the right solution to start with, and we could have those talks. But um, but I'm just saying like what is a best practice for smart licensing in an air gap world because that's just a reality that a lot of us service providers have to live with. And so I'm hoping smarter people than me can help me in this group propose some of these ways to like overcome these challenges. Do you think a best practice would be um, splitting the dependency, ref not having any, um, I guess it's like a full reference where it, it hard codes. Dependency should not have the repository hard coded with the artifact so that you can save the artifacts to your own private registry, do scanning separate from the image version that much is absolutely true right it's never going to be where the developer put it in the first place it's always going to be on a different repository so absolutely repository urls have to be flexible so that so that could be maybe a best practice like they i don't know how often it is but there may be helm charts out there um, i've definitely seen it in other code that reference the entire repository as the URL, uh, and I'm using URL in general, it may not be HTTP, but they designate the entire thing. So then those Helm charts would not work. You would have to do something like uh, a uh, proxy caching or a fake it with DNS and or ideally we get a Helm chart, which is that's what right. happens. Yeah. Right. So so if, if we could say, if we could find some stuff, it seems like there's some stuff around here that we could push on, push forward as best practices on how you should write your Helm charts. And mm -hmm. I just realized we are over time. Yeah, That's I have to go. Months. Taylor, um, those are <coughs> those in the notes because those are key points I want to talk on later is like, 
additional stuff. Like when you reference an entire repository, if you pull all of Helm, you get things like Bitcoin mining charts and things like that. So there, there's a lot to unpack and it's also more reasons why we air gap, but I'm now a couple minutes late to my next call. So I will chat with you all on Slack and next week. Thanks everyone. See y'all next Monday. Dale. Bye.